Welcome once again to the Frankincense Center. We're coming live to you from this center, trusting God to convey his mind to you listeners and viewers as he has been getting it across to us. We've been on a burden, the controversy of Zion. Now, earlier episodes, we've been looking at what is Zion. We took time to understand that picture very well. And the summary of that discourse is the fact that Zion represents the best breed of mankind that God in his wisdom and plan has brought to the fullness of the stature of Christ. God has made from amongst men people that has become like Jesus Christ, which is the echo from the beginning. Let us make man in our own image, in our exact likeness. And to the end in Revelation, it says he has made us priests and kings unto our God. This is the purpose. This is what Zion represents the city. These people are the city. They make up the city of the living God. The city is not just the landmass. The city is the people therein. They are the house of God. They are the perfection of beauty. They are also the heavenly Jerusalem. They go by several, they are the bride of Christ. They are the celestial city we are looking at that is coming down out from God. So we did that summary and we proceeded to understand why this city must be built. And in our summary, we said it must be built because God has desired it. Again, that the people of God may have a possession, that there might be salvation and strength available that joy and rejoicing may resound amongst his people, and that the praise and beauty of our God might be revealed, the excellency of his glory. He says, when God must have built Zion, he will appear in her, in his glory. And finally, for the leadership, and rulership of the nations, that when these people come forth, they will take leadership of the nations. They will govern the creations of God forever and ever and ever. Of course, Daniel said that this is the end of the matter. That the people of the Most High God shall possess the kingdom even forever and ever, even forever. So that is the end. The end of all this controversy is that the people of the Most High shall possess the kingdom. There's no how. And this is what we are looking forward to. That the, the matter, the, and Revelation says that the kingdoms of this world has become the kingdoms of our Christ and his Messiah. And it shall reign forever and ever with his sins on the earth. So this is the trust. Now, our burden this hour is on the same controversy, but focused on how do we take the first step in making sure that this functional church comes in place? How do we take the first step? What is the next necessary step? Since we have seen what it is, and we have known why it must be done, then how do we take the next step? And honestly, the next step, just like every deal that we do, is that when you have made the decision that you want to build a house, and possible capacity is available to execute that project, in making sure the house is now erected, there must be first a conceived idea of what this house looks like. 
Because you have to conceive it first in the mind, then you translate it somewhat in writing before you now have a physical structure erected. So there is a progression by which, as humans, what we want to do takes that process until it comes to the concrete realm. In the abstract realm, there's a conception. Then there's a translation to impact material realm. That is the scribbling of the blueprint. And after that, there's a translation from the blueprint to the concrete house. So you, you who is the builder sits with the architect. You seem to tell the architect, look at the piece of land, look at the project, look at, and the architect reasons with you. That process is to get a picture, a picture of what it looks like, what it will look like when it is done. And that picture concretizes in a script, blueprint, the draft, it is made. And once it is done, okay, everybody agrees, oh, this is what it's going to look like. So before even the physical building sees the daylight, you know exactly what that building will look like in your mind. This is the process of betting any project or product or building or whatsoever. Now, God in his wisdom, who made us this way, also goes by the same principle. So in every structure that is built for and by him, this process is also taken. And that's the process we are going to be seeing so that every builder in this last time to this house must have a clear picture because the purpose of the, the owner of the building calling the actor, the owner of the building may not have the architectural skill or the master builder skill. An architect simply means master builder. In Greek, it's called architecton. And that's why Paul said that he, as a master builder, has laid the foundation. And the other people now comes up. So an architect is a skilled master builder. When Moses went up to the mountain, he received a pattern from God. But he doesn't have the skill. So some brothers, Bezalel and Oholia, were called in as master builders. And they kept liaison until the picture received from heaven is transmitted to them and they can have a concept of it so that they can now translate it to material structure. I want us to pay attention to this because this is where the challenge is today. The God of heaven has determined to build a house, to build a people, to fashion a people that will look like his son. The pattern set before us is Jesus Christ. The challenge is translating aspects of this building to make sure that all that are raised conform to that image that he has already set. Now, the original owner of the building is God Almighty. He remains the owner. And Paul said that he is a master builder. And we are co-laborers with Christ. So there are many hands that are designed of God to be part of this building, which are seen in the scripture. We're just trying to get a framework of our discourse this morning. Laborers have to put, and every laborer doing whatever they are doing must do it with the consciousness of the awareness of how that work ties to the finishing product. How that work they are doing ties to the finished product. If they are taking a block to place, the, a, each particular block that is placed has relevance to the finishing product or the finished product. Each trolley that is taken and cuts a cement mixture to place with a plumb line to check, it has implications 
to the Phillips building. And the architect draws the picture. The master builder interprets, takes laborers into the, the field, and begin to interpret them. Most laborers may not have the capacity to understand the concept of the architect. It doesn't really matter. But there's an interpreter or the foreman. So everyone is playing a different role. The idea is at the end of the day, what is in the heart or mind of the owner of the building is actualized. So you could see amongst men within the human realm how tedious this process is. So at the end of the day, the satisfaction of the man who set himself to create and set up a building will be guaranteed. This is the trend. Now, having said this, now let's go up a bit. Let's look up to God and to his house and to his building and see what we need to do. Now, we see something very, very important. I must be quick to say that nobody stands to do a walk in the house, in this house of God, if that person does not have the revealed plan from God. There is a knowledge. The English says knowledge. But the Greek has four of three words of knowledge. Let me to three for now. Three words regarding knowledge. The first one is called gnosis, which literally means information knowledge. Somebody informed you about something. The work of God and the building of this house can never thrive on plain information because it's not a human work. There is another word knowledge called gnosko. Gnosko is experiential knowledge like a man will know the wife by experience, having lived with her for such a long time, or vice versa. No school is a spiritual knowledge, and in the world, the highest that anybody can know of something is experience. That's why science, our, our civilization, in the world of science, thrives on empirical knowledge, which is experiential knowledge. Knowledge of the five senses. Once it is empirically proven, okay, good. We can accept it that this is knowledge because we have experienced it. What they can test, can touch, can feel, can hear, can perceive, that's all. But beside these two, there's a third dimension of knowledge called epignosis. And the word epi means superior or higher in Greek. Epignosis. This is revelation knowledge, it's superior knowledge. Now, let me illustrate regarding this. Information knowledge. There's a snake out there, out there by the street. And somebody comes into this house and says, come on. Bro, there's a snake out there. He has informed us there's a snake. We didn't go there to see what to experience it. But we have the knowledge by information. That knowledge that we have now, helps us not to go. So, we got to know by information. There's a snake out there. That is Gnosis. Again, we look at the other side. Nobody told us there's a snake out there. We just wanted to go out and ride there. We saw a snake emerging on the street. And we jump, oh, there's a snake. How did we know? Because with our five senses, we can relate to the fact that there's a snake. That is called Nosco, experiential. We have experienced there's a snake there. Now, the third dimension, that, which is a pignosis, is that nobody came to, told us, to tell us. We did not go there to see or experience. And maybe you're just waking up this morning. And the Spirit revealed to you in the ninth vision, that by trance or by open vision or by prophecy or by whatever means of divine channel of communication, letting you know not to go out because there's a snake. 
And while you obey to keep yourself here by that superior knowledge, here comes somebody coming and say, oh, I came from there and there's a snake there. The person knew by experience, but you knew by revelation. So revelation knowledge is the highest form of knowledge. Most people in the world says, look, that experience is the best teacher. I said, no, 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 no. It's a good teacher, not a best teacher. The life is too short, somebody says, for you to experience everything. That's why it is important to know that the Holy Ghost is the best teacher because he teaches us by revelation and intuition, teaching from within. It's important to realize that if our experience is sufficient or if the information we receive from pastor or priest or whosoever is sufficient, then there will be no need for the Holy Ghost. That's what the superior and best teacher you can have in life is the Holy Ghost. And if in your Christian life, all that you know about God is what somebody told you about him, you are the greatest loser. I repeat, if in your life, all that you know about God is what somebody told you about him, you are the greatest loser. And that's why we do not know God by information. We know him by revelation. He said, no man can know the Son except it be revealed to him by the Father. All the oppressions of God is absolutely by revelation. And that's why the holy apostles and prophets walk by revelation. Everything is revelation. Paul said, what the Lord revealed. He said, I have not seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9, neither he has had, neither has it entered into the heart of man what the Lord has prepared for them that love him. And verse 10, he says, but it has been revealed to us by the Holy Ghost. So anyhow you look at the work of God, it comes by revelation of the Spirit. Therefore, those who do not have a relationship with the Holy Ghost cannot do this work. They cannot. They may want to do it, but they, will, they don't know where things are. They may want to see other people do it. They will keep doing it, but they don't know how the pattern, how the plan, what the what the end goal is like. So they will work with it onto fertility. In fact, they will create more havoc than the intended purpose. So you see, by revelation, which is the key framework by which the church lives, thrives, and survives, nothing else. When Paul was to be adopted into the community of the saints, he was on his way to Damascus. And the Lord met him and struck him down. Right from there, he took revelation of the Spirit for that process to be completed. He queried the Lord, he said, what's the next agenda? He said, don't worry, when you get into Damascus, it shall be told you what to do. And he got into Damascus. One disciple in Damascus called Ananias. In his quiet end, Nobody, I mean, the Lord came to him. The Holy Ghost, began, and that's one phenomenon that is very versatile all over the place in the New Covenant, the New Testament. The interaction of the Holy Ghost with the people of God. That relationship, that engagement, that consistency, because it is the Holy Spirit that does this work through us. So to Ananias, the Holy Ghost said, this is the pattern, this is the picture, this is the situation. Ananias had his own information from below. He said, this is the information I have. The Holy Ghost said, this is the information available. And I usually ask, who is right, who is wrong? And Ananias is right. The Holy Ghost is right. And here brings us to a fundamental principle which I would like to drop here. 
in spiritual work that you are right does not mean you are right. It all depends on which perspective or which dimension. Is it natural? You're approaching it or spiritual you're approaching it. You might be naturally right, but spiritually wrong. And you might be spiritually right, but naturally wrong. That's why as men that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And that's why when the brethren come and boast, or those who are in the vineyard of God come to boast, I was there. I saw it. I had it myself. This is what it means. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. But it says, there's a comfort a rod out of Jesse in Isaiah 11. And the blood shall grow from his side. And the Spirit of the Lord shall come upon him. And then he said, the sevenfold Spirit of God say, he will not judge by the hearing of his ears or by the seeing of his eyes. The work of the Spirit is not determined by what you have had or what you have seen, neither by information or experience. It's by revelation. That's why no matter what information you have about a brother or a sister or a particular issue, go to God and wait on him and say, Lord, what is your perspective on this matter? And you will be shocked that the, when God reveals the states of that matter, You'll be shocked. That's why no matter how firm you are and convinced you are on the matter, if it is not God that has led you to that conviction, hold that conviction loosely. Hold that conviction loosely. Because what you have been informed of and what you have experienced is totally different regarding the order of things in the heaven. Completely different. And this is what I must encourage every one of us to come to that consciousness and that light so that we do not in any way lose grip with what God is bringing to us. And that brings me to something else. Here, we are not theologians. They will seek to know the plans and purpose of God by the Spirit of God. The difference between theology and revelation is clear. Theology, a theologian is a man who is telling you what somebody told him, that somebody told that person, that somebody told that person that what God is all about. So theologians work by information already available from generation to generation. And they study it. One professor says it and one doctor says it. And there's somebody telling you what somebody told him, that somebody told him, that somebody told him, and they put it in curriculum and teach. That's a theology. It is good, but not sufficient regarding the house of God. So if you're going to Bible school, by all means go. If you want to learn theology, go and learn. But then know that it's just information knowledge which is insufficient in building the house of God. But the difference between theology and revelation is a revelation is not what somebody is telling you about God. It is what God himself is telling you about himself. And this is where we anchor. This is where we anchor that this work of God can only be done by revelation. It says, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, and I want us to read that. So 1 Corinthians Chapter 2, very important. Very important. 1 Corinthians 2, I think verse 11 says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of the Father. Verse 10 makes it clear. Verse 9 says, But it is written, I has not seen, nor ear had, neither had it entered into the heart of man. The things which God has prepared for them, and love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his spirit, for the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. But still say, it has been revealed. 
And if you look at verse 20, it says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And the version says, expressing spiritual truth in spiritual language. For it says, but the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually the son. What are we saying? What are we saying for crying out loud? You cannot do this work, no matter even if you are called, even if you call yourself, even if you are building houses in the name of the Lord and doing all sorts of things in the name of ministry, if the Spirit is not guiding you and leading you daily on which aspect of the building the attention of heaven is needed, that you might be relevant to it, you are is a waste. It's a total waste. That's why we do not proceed with theological framework, but we walk by revelation. And anything you want to do, either for God or with God or in the name of God, that the Spirit is not leading you, stop, don't go. Because as men that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. In fact, the Bible, Jesus said that no man receives anything except to be revealed to him from heaven. And John the Baptist echoed the same. So the work of God is exclusively the prerogative of the Holy Ghost. Nobody. That's why we stand attention, waiting on him to say, do this, do this. He knows the plan. He knows the pattern. He knows the detail. He knows what to do. And every work that any man has done for him, he has been the one that has revealed the pattern or the blueprint or the picture. And this is why we're looking at this burden at this point. Because the mess in our generation is that natural man, look at that scripture says, the natural man cannot understand anything by the Spirit of God. Natural men are the ones providing leadership in the church. Where do they know that the church is going? The church is not the organized religion we see. That is not the church of God. These are the products of men. That's why the denominations, certainly none was formed of God. None. No denomination is of God. That's why the body of Christ, the genuine, true body of Christ is found and intercalated in the denominations. They are only the people who, by the Spirit of God, are keyed into the spirits and walking with the Holy Ghost. Wherever they may be found, they belong to that spiritual body. And they do so by the revelation of the Spirit, no matter which denominational barrier or war they find themselves in. That's why we don't stand here to advocate for our church or denomination. No, 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 no. We only advocate seeking the Holy Ghost and then key in. He will tell you what to do. We only encourage people to mature to the point where they can hear the Holy Ghost and relate with him properly and then proceed with what he's telling them. So we see today the total, the burden and the pain of this generation is that we see what is called church, laid out everywhere. Natural men are heading them. Natural men who have no visibility about what heaven is talking about. And this present organized church has no hope and cannot offer redemption to the world. They are not part of the Zion company that we are looking towards. They cannot. Because the fundamental thing that is needed is to be laid by the Holy. Is the Holy Ghost the governor? He's the governor of the Church of God. There's a church visible. There's a church invisible. There's a church militant on earth. There's a church triumphant in the heavens. So there's a church above and there's a church below. The church above is the general assembly. Then we have here local assemblies all over the place. A wise local assembly seeks one thing. That's why when the church organizes this program, they are out of God's program. Because the program of God comes from the General Assembly. And I ask church leaders, I put it to you as a church leader. 
How many of you have attended the General Assembly? How many of you have been with the Holy Ghost to know what's going on in the heaven? And therefore try to make sure that what is being done in the heaven aligns with what is going on in the earth, in your local assembly. And this is the first, the first and singular body that Jesus expressed when he was trying to teach his disciples on how to pray. He said, Our Father, which is hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth in our local assemblies. That is the embassy of Christ on earth. It starts from there. Thy will be done in our local assembly as it is already going on in the general assembly. And today we come to our local assemblies every Sunday or every day of the week with our records to what is going on above, with our records to what the Holy Ghost is saying. We only have our program. Continue your program. At the end, let it not be said of you, Oh Lord, you are uttering. I have done this in your name. I have built it. I have raised an assembly in your name. I have done this in your name. I have ministered in your name. We were worshiping and singing in your name. So I don't know you. Whatever you did, you didn't do with the plan. Because there's a plan that the Holy Ghost has waiting to tell his people what it is that they might build according to pattern. But every man that comes up has his own plan. Go on with your plan. Go on with your plan. Go. Nobody is here to criticize. Go on with your plan. At the end, you now know whether your plan is God's plan. So the wise thing to do, and I solemnly appeal to you, seek God and ask him what is your plan. No matter what your plan is, it's very unfortunate that the adulterous system and the worst that have infiltrated in the church and every man rising in the ministry has his own pomp and pageantry to display. Has his own pride to display. Has his own, you know, uh, egocentric elements to show, showcase at the platform of ministry. Without recourse to the very plan of God which he has in mind for his people. This house of God, this building that is in the Merkin, can only be accomplished by the leading of the Holy Ghost. And that's why the scripture says, as men that are laid by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So we make progress in trying to piece this together. From the beginning, like we said, the purpose that God wants to dwell among his people. And if you look at when God began to attempt to dwell, among these people, he called Moses. He said, come Moses, come. It's important that you go in getting what you need to build, come up first. I have a plan in the heavens how my church is going to be. Remember what Moses saw in that mountain when he ascended into heaven was the church of God. That's what he saw. The city of God. The church of the firstborn. And he reproduced it in the form of the tabernacle in the wilderness. They said, toy form. That's what he did. That Israel would exercise their senses therein until the time this church is established upon the earth. But Moses cannot just start building. God said, come, let me give you a blueprint. That's where we started this morning. The blueprint must be revealed and released. And the people who are privileged or whom God has chosen to come in that touch with him for the revelation of the blueprint, they are called apostles. 
primary duty of the apostle is to understand what the blueprint is. The pattern of the house and how it has to be built. That's the primary duty of an apostolic ministry. Today people are asking apostles, this apostle is just, they are just, it's a mockery. It's child's play. Answer whatever name you want to answer. That's your business. But any man who pays the price of ascending up the hills of God to receive from God the blueprint of the work in his generation, that is an apostle. No man take this honor unto himself, as Paul says in Hebrews. But it is called. He said, a priest is a man who is taken from amongst men, ordained from men in matters relating to God. He is called and said, Come up for the sake of these people and the work that they must do. Come up and receive a picture, a blueprint of what the work will be. So when you receive and go down, you memorize what it is that God has shown you. And you begin to instruct the people to build according to the picture. This apostolic ministry. That's why Paul was bold enough when Peter was building with Barnabas in a different direction. He said, no, 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 no. no. Oh, bro, even though you people came before me to this faith, even though you met with Christ physically, but that night, Jesus revealed to me that this is the pattern of the church. Don't go, don't do it this way, you're wrong. This is the way. That is the authority he had. Because he ascended unto God and saw the blueprint of the church. And in his teaching, he was emphatic. He said, no, 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 no. This is the way to go. This is the way to go. This is the, no, this is wrong. This is no, this is not it. That is an apostolic ministry. He was very emphatic. He said, The gospel that I have received from God. In fact, Paul said, It is my God. He referred it as my gospel. He owned it. He knew what he saw. He knew where he went to. He said, If even an angel come from heaven, to tell you something contrary to the pattern you have received from us. Let that angel be eternally cost. This is the authenticity of the ministry he has obtained. The ability to go before God and receive the blueprints before any work is done. The worldwide church to the Gentile world has a different blueprint. And God had to take him up. And he saw what the blueprint is. And when he came, the Holy Ghost said, separate him. They let him separate him for the work they need to do. And they proceeded. And he was teaching them, not according to what is available or what has been, but according to the pattern he has received. That's why his own gospel was the other way. The Jews say you are turning the whole world upside down. He said, no, I'm actually turning the right side up because of what I saw. At the point of death, where he was being judged and being condemned, he would raise his hand and say, no, 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 no. You people are making me. This is the direction. He said, I do not care about my life. All I want is to publish this. Praise, blessed be the name of the Lord that we had such people. Else, what will we be doing today? The gospel will not get to us. Judaism would have overrun the gospel. Because the Judaism also had that same power. That's that Moses went up and received and established the framework of Judaism. It took Paul to go up again and receive and establish the framework of the church. If Paul did not go up, Christianity wouldn't have had the opportunity of surviving. That's why every standpoint he said, this is the direction. Moses did well. But Moses, what Moses did was 
regarding what we are going to be doing now. And he told his Jewish brethren, from here to here is done away with. But hereafter, this is the direction to go. That is what led to the writing of the book of the Hebrews. So you could see that the challenge here is enormous. And we as a people must appreciate the grace that God has given us in every way. And may his grace sustain and push this work. So let's go faster. You look at Exodus 25, verse 8 and 9. It's important that we read when God called Moses. He says, I let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I should thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. In other words, in the building of the house of God, something is of a primary importance, and that is the pattern. And I dare to question ministries and ministers. The work you're doing, what pattern is it? Is it your own pattern? Or the divine pattern revealed by God? And that is a challenge. Is it your own pattern? The blueprint is out there in the scripture. How we should labor in the church of God. For he, it is his church. Not our church. Today, this is a generation that men have worked so bold as to look God in the eye and say, I also have a church. If you have a church, Lord, this is my own church also. A man can refer to a portion of the body of Christ's his church. It's a sin to be repented of. It's a sin because in reality, those who are possessing the people of God to their own advantage, they are actually raping the wife of Christ. <clears throat> and this is something we as a people must be very, very careful. I've seen such in this generation. People come up. Anyway, this is even for those who were once born again. Because those who call themselves ministers today, no, no, most of them, most of them are not born again. So they are free to do what they are doing and they will receive the recompense of their reward adequately. Because say that you shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. This is one law that the scripture was so vocal that for God will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So it's something challenging that we are seeing in our day. So Moses came to the mountains of God and God unveiled the heavens to him. He said, Moses, put your mind on what you're seeing and absorb it. Absorb the details of what you're seeing. Because I want you to go down among Israel and reproduce exactly what you're seeing. You can't build from your head. You can't build from your feelings. You can't build from your thoughts. You can't build from how you like it. You must do it according to what I have shown you in the mouth. The question is, what has God shown you in the mount? Have you ever ascended to the mountains of God? In the Bible, the psalmist says, who shall ascend to the holy hills of God? And the conditions are there. We have not lifted up his soul to vanity. One condition. One condition. Most times we think it's all about good and evil, sin and righteousness. No, 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 no. 
It's not a choice between black and white. Sometimes it's a choice between different shades of gray. The reality is that vanity may not be sinful and may not be righteousness. Vanity is not good and is not evil. But the Bible took time to address vanity as a condition that will stop any soul from ascending to the heels of God. Living a vain life, a life of vanity. Because anything that does not glorify God directly in your life, that is vanity. You see a preacher living like a Hollywood star. He said that God has provided and therefore it is vanity. It is vanity. There is no condition for you to live out your ambition with the gospel. You may have had an ambition of becoming a celebrity, not on the platform of the gospel of Christ. If you do it, you are shut down from ascending. You can only build what you have in your mind, not the revealed pattern of God. That's what we have everywhere. A young man stands in ministry, just look at what is in his mind. To be like so, 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 and so with a worldwide evangelistic ministry. Vanity. Vanity. Years ago, I used to say, so let me check my words. Today, I know better. I know better. That's why I'm very, very direct over these matters. Vanity. The days ahead is not looking good for anybody. But unto those who have not lifted up their soul to vanity, there shall be a visitation from God. So, the pattern must be seen. And I speak to a young Christian who had just received Christ, maybe young in age, maybe young in faith. You must not depend only on your pastor and other people to defend your Christianity. You must seek the way to Zion. The Bible says every one of them in Psalm 46, they climb until they arrive before God in Zion. Everyone. Holy hills of God. And what pattern are you seeking in God that you are going to model your life after? Recently, I had the privilege of addressing the young people in my assembly, in all our assembly. And I called their attention to something very, very critical. The fact that most of them are more interested in their career than in the ministry. That is a life of those who lack visibility of the pattern of God. When Paul says in Ephesians 4 regarding our vocation in Christ, and I get to ask, what is your vocation in Christ? Is it being an engineer, software engineer, or being a, 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 a marketer, or a medical doctor, or a scientist? Is that your vocation? No, 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 no. The vocation is to understand the pattern of God and build the city of our God. That's that. That is the vocation where we, we have called one God, one hope, one faith, one baptism, the Father of all who is all and in all. And to everyone is giving grace according to the Spirit of the Lord. To make sure that our house is built. Some he gave apostles, some prophets, evangelists, till, and the ministry will go till we all come to the union. This is the vocation, this is the pattern. Where do you fit in it? Your science, the arts you learned, the school you went to, the profession on the natural realm that you have exercised yourself in. They are to pay the bill for the revocation. That is not your vocation. Your vocation 
is understanding the way to this city and asking the Holy Ghost lead me by the way I should go that this city might be built and my own contribution in my lifetime might be supplied before I exit because Jesus said there are only 12 hours appointed for men to walk so the ninth comment when no man will walk every man is appointed 12 hours symbolic hours of course you know it's your lifetime so basically the pattern must be revealed that is your vocation as the apostles come from the realms of God with the mind of God and unveiling the mind of God each individual within the city within the community of the saints should absorb it and know where they come in so you see Moses did that job very well he came down from the mountains of God and the Lord instructed them whom he would call he called the brother Bezalel, then Aholiab, and all that are wise-hearted, who have been filled with the spirit of craftsmanship. We don't have time to go into those details. And they stood. And as they sat, Moses kept repeating what he saw in the heavens. They would go and build and bring, he said, no, 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 no. Do it this way, do it this way. Moses never knew any craft, but he saw something. But these men, they are the craftsmen. The Lord has filled them with the spirit of wisdom and knowledge in all craftsmanship. And also those who, the spirit of the wild-hearted, wise-hearted. All of them, both women and men all over the place doing all kinds of cunning works of crafts they're doing it they will do and bring and Moses will look and compare with the picture he has already received and say no 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 just do it this way no 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 do it this way no 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 no, no. and it was a tedious tedious work tedious work tedious work you don't know the tediousness of this work you get a bar of gold and you beat it into a lamp stand seven branches one bar of gold while Moses cannot do that Bezalel can do that but Moses has to supply the picture that's why in the body of Christ no man is a champion you have your assignment in an area to execute just be faithful in that area you can't be the Lord and champion of all. That's why the framework of hierarchy in the body of Christ of setting one man over the rest, wrong. Wrong. And this is a challenge we are having today. That Jesus did not ordain hierarchy, but he ordained leadership. And the church finds it so difficult not to, difficult to understand that hierarchy it's different from leadership. The world can separate the two. Because to them, hierarchy is leadership. And leadership is hierarchy. To the church, it is not so. Jesus said, it shall not be so among you. In the world, there are Gentiles, the nations, exercise authority and dominion and lordship over their subjects. But among you, it shall not be so. Instead, he that is a leader, or he supports leadership, let him be your bond slave. The person that you be will be trampled upon if there's something like that. So he ordained leadership, but he destroyed hierarchy. Because hierarchy is not the order of man, it's the order of angels. We'll talk about it someday. That's our focus today. So you could see that Moses had a responsibility. Bezalel, Oholiab, and all that are wise hearted, the scripture says, had other responsibilities. And they will be doing their own 
and Moses will be doing his own and there is comparison and there is comparison until the house of when when most Basalel acknowledged the responsibility that Moses had and Moses acknowledged the responsibility that Basalel had because it was God that called Basalel by name hey he says, see, I have called by name Basalel. God called Basalel by name and told Moses, this man, this is the man that's going to do it. So who appointed Basalel? God. And told Moses, go and call him. That's why in an apostolic ministry, you, as you ascend, you see from the vantage point, not only what you are going to do, but also who are the people God has placed in position. You are going to submit to them. Most people don't say, okay, because I'm the apostle that brought this. I can imagine if you can't do it, I can call anybody. No, 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 no. God called Basile by name. I said, go ahead. So there is a true ministry standing, doing different things or complete, submitting one to another, that the house of God might be built. When people are arguing about the hierarchy, the order of Moses, no, 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 no. If you go into it, you now know that no, 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 no. Yeah, Moses was lifted and called. Even in that weak order, as the Lord said, the, the word of God says, finding fault with it, he decided to make a new one. That faulty order. Yet, you could see how men depended on each other to carry out the word of God. So, there must be an ascension to have a clear picture of what the tabernacle or the house of God, the pattern is. Now, if you look at the same Exodus 29, it's important that we as a people get it. Exodus 29, 45, it indicates also to us That God in his interests dwell among his people. And if you look at uh, Hebrews 3.2, Hebrews 3.6, that's why we we'll say a few things, Hebrews 3.6. Now, you could see here that Paul was very specific about what is to be done. Look at from verse 3, from verse 1. Okay, it says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. So for this man, for this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Inasmuch as he who builded the house had more honor than the house. Yeah. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. Verse 5, and Moses verily, I want you to take note of that. Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. So the faithfulness of Moses is not even just for that time. It's for the time wherein we are and the things to be spoken therein. But it says, Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, firm unto the end. So you could see indicating the faithfulness of Moses. And it has to do. So if you look at Hebrews also 9, 1 to 2, you see, it says, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinance of divine services and the worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was a candlestick and the table and the shoe bread, which is called the sanctuary. Now if you look at Hebrews 8, 1. Hebrews 8, 1. 
He said, now of the things which we have spoken, this is a sum. We want to summarize. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. He's a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. In other words, if you ascend the heavens of God today, you will see the true tabernacle. The Bible said the true tabernacle, the true, an adjective qualifying the true tabernacle. If there is the true tabernacle, then what is the one that Moses built? Is a shadow. Is a toy one. But the real deal is in the heavens. And that's why Colossians also, look at Colossians. Colossians 2, 2, 16. Paul, he said, And let no man judge you in meat, in drink, in rest of the holy day. These are ordinances. Or the new moon, or the Sabbath day. See, which are, that is all that was contained therein in the old covenant. See, which are shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. And the verse say the reality is in Christ. So whatever that happened in the Old Testament, shadows, toy, the real substance is in the church. That's why the church is the perfection of beauty. Those are some people who have been arguing, oh, Israel, how I wish I was born an Israelite. Oh, how I wish I was there. How I wish I was Jew. How I wish. You don't need to, you don't need to stretch yourself. It's, not, it's useless. The ones that are born Jews, are they better off? Yeah, they, they were favored of God at that time, in hope of this time, when all nations shall be brought into the economy of God. That's what Paul was saying in Ephesians. He says, the broken, the wall of partition has been broken, that all nations can come. 